All right. So good evening to everyone. And tell you, um, oh man, John 6 has really been a wonderful journey uh, to me. I'm prayerful that it has been the same for you who have joined us. And um, if you haven't joined us, you can absolutely uh, go to the past messages, uh, the past studies. We have them up on our YouTube page where you can get to them. And I'll make sure that everybody gets a link to that. This week, uh, we've actually updated past ones. I think I got one more to make sure we get up there. So we'll be good with that very soon. We're going to be closing out chapter six tonight and then moving into chapter seven, where that's going to take us into a number of different experiences. And so what we want to do is go ahead and uh, pray for our time together, and then we're going to get rolling. All right. Our Father, we thank you that you enrich us in the truth. You enrich us in that which is good. You enrich us in that which is a blessing so that we might be a blessing. You have established your word in our hearts. And sometimes we suppress it. But because of what you have done through Christ, we are able to see that what you have written on our hearts is able to truly emerge and be of benefit and value to us and others around us. But ultimately, it's able to be a benefit to your glory, your majesty, your power. And so tonight as we close uh, this section that we have been going through, uh, bless our hearing, bless our receiving, bless our doing from what we hear and received, and even bless our delivering tonight, that it may be to the praise of your glory so that we may truly see who you are and who you have called us to be. This we pray in the glorious name of Christ Jesus. We say amen. amen. And so I tell you that we, we really covered majority of this uh, last week. And we didn't finish it though. Uh, we read everything, but I uh, did not really tackle the portion where Peter spoke out about what it is that they understood about Jesus. And uh, I want us to, as we focus on it tonight, we'll take a little bit of a journey into the New Testament toward the end because there is some perspective that we want to give with regard to the importance of this perspective regarding the words of eternal life, but also the heartbreaking truth. So, you know, we got those three questions we focus on. What does it say? What does it mean? How must it be applied? So let's start with what it says so we can make way into uh, our study and understanding what it means and how must we apply it. So this is John 6 and starting at the 60th verse down to the 71st. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. 
The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. But Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said to them, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my father, by the father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. Now, last week, as we talked about this, uh, we talked about the distinction between those who did not believe and those who did believe. And those who do not believe, they focus on what is seen, what is satisfying, what is benefited from, what is received. Good to see all those others who have joined in tonight. Good to see y'all. And tonight, we want to focus on the perspective with regard to Peter's communicating the words of eternal life are in Christ, and then Jesus's words. And then we want to take a little journey, like I said earlier, into the latter part of the New Testament, into a letter from Peter a first portion of one of his letters to get some perspective about what it is that's really powerful here. Now, let me give some recap to bring us back up to where we are. This all started with Jesus, not just feeding the 5,000 plus women and children, which was probably 20,000 plus, but it really kind of started um, when Jesus began on the Sabbath day, which is probably a year or more, maybe six months to about a year or more from this situation where he healed the, the man at the pool of Bethesda, Bethesda, I'm sorry. And so that created a little bit of a stink and a ruckus to where Jesus had to kind of get out of town and he ended up in the area and region uh, that he was in, uh, Galilee primarily performing his, going about his ministry because he was trying to stay away from the religious leaders because it wasn't time for him to go yet. So <laughs> he finds himself in the position to where the 5,000 plus women and children are coming to him. And he then engages uh, his disciples with questions about feeding the multitude. And he did that to test them. He did that to challenge what they were thinking and how they were thinking. And then uh, took the two fish and the five loaves that had been in water and that had been uh, from the ground. And he made things that had never touched the ground and never had been in the water. Then he perceived that the people, after seeing this miraculous miracle and them having the best meal they probably would ever have in their life, or that anybody has ever had in their life for that matter, they wanted to make him king. And Jesus found a way to get rid of them and get out of Dodge, sent his disciples ahead of him. And he went about to uh, be in solitude with the Father, we know. Then Jesus was on the water, walking with himself in the water, coming to the place where the disciples were 
struggling. They had found themselves not making much progress. They were about three miles from land and they had been out on the water for hours. And they were distressed, not just by that reality, but by the winds and the waves being so tumultuous. So then we come to where they are encountering Jesus. Jesus bids Peter to come walk on the water. He sink in and then picks him back up. They walk back to the water together. Then instead of being in wow, they worship him. And then they find themselves making it to land. And the people who had had their fill of the bread and the fish wanted to find. Jesus. And so they came to Capernaum or Capernaum, whichever one you prefer, to find him. They get there and they encounter him and engage him. And one of the first questions he asks is, uh, or he states to them is, uh, you're not seeking me because of anything other than the fact that you ate the fish and the loaves. They, they were wanting some more of what they got. So much and so they actually said that you know, our parents, our forefathers ate manna in the wilderness, you know, which is to say, hey, so what you going to do for us? You know, <laughs> they ate manna. What miraculous thing are you going to do food wise other than what you've already done? Remember that they're looking at the miracles. They're looking at the signs, the wonders they wanted because of something they get from it. And Jesus goes on and tells them about how his flesh and his blood is to be eaten. And we talked about that. His flesh is to be eaten. His blood is to be drank. And we talked about that. And, and I think at some point in the future, I want to come back and really talk through that so you can understand what Jesus was saying and the metaphoric connections he was speaking to that they just missed. It like literally went over their head. But we, we went into the Old Testament and we looked at how in the time when Noah and his wife and sons and daughters-in-law came off the boat, off the ark, that they were given to eat the flesh of the creatures, but not drink its blood. But here it is now, Jesus is saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And we know he was the lamb of God. And there, there's a lot of metaphorics there. So, so what's being said? Well, the, the thing that needs to be understood is in the blood is life. God said, don't drink the blood of those creatures because the soul of the creature, the life of the creatures in the blood. Well, Jesus is saying, drink my blood. Why? Because you need life. So, we, so, so basically it's talking about consuming his life, you see? And so then they have some problems with that. And that's where we find ourselves in our text where they say, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? In other words, and Jesus actually says this, they take offense at this. And we said this last week. They said this last week that I mean, we said this last week, that offense is only if something is against you. So basically, they took an offense to what Jesus said because they were obviously adversaries to him. Yeah. Very important perspective. We will never walk away from anyone or anything that we agree with. If we agree with it, we're going to stay with it. We're going to support it strongly. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that we are connected. That's even the power of marriage. That, that's even the perspective that Jesus is really speaking to without speaking to it because he is the what? He's the bridegroom. The church is his bride. And so here it is, the, the bride and the groom are having some issues. I know you weren't thinking about this is where we're going tonight. I just want to share it. <laughs> Here's the truth. The church, the disciples, those who are followers, you have 
some who follow and some who follow and stop following. Then you have some who don't follow. The people who follow are considered the church. And when they stop following, John tells us later on in his in one of his other letters that those who walk away evidence that they were never of or with. <laughs> we'll come back to that another time. So there, there's a lot of things that are going on here, but here's what I want us to get to. We walk down a little bit further and Jesus even speaks to those who do not believe. And those who do not believe we talked about are those who are committed only for their gain and benefit, which means they don't believe, they just give an impression of it, or they just completely don't. And the greatest sin we can commit is to fail to believe on the truth, to believe on the one who is the truth, the one who comes in the name of the truth. So it goes on, very key part here, it says, John gives a little parenthesis for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Remember, we saw in John, the second chapter, or, right, or at the end of it, yes, at the end of it, that Jesus knows what is in man, okay? And so he does not entrust himself to people in certain ways because he goes on and says, this is why I told you that no one could come to me unless it is granted him by my father. Those who fail to believe fail to receive the granting of fellowship with Christ. That's what that's really saying. If you fail to believe, the father knows the heart. He sees the heart, right? If you have an unbelieving heart, you can just trust whether you act like it or not, that you will not be granted to have fellowship with Christ. And therefore Christ knows what's in him because the father expresses and communicates all things to the son as well as he knows what's in man because he created man. And therefore, he can just believe that Jesus is not gonna give himself to somebody who has not truly evidenced belief. So watch this. The many disciples who disagree with Jesus, it says, turn back. This is one of those examples of backslide. <laughs> they turned away <laughs> and no longer walked with him. It's deeper than backsliding, though. They made a conscious decision to reject the truth. I, I think it's important to ensure that we understand what happened. They saw Christ. They heard Christ. They engaged with Christ. They even sought him out. And because he said something they did not like, they did not agree with, they did not approve of, like they were somebody special, like we're somebody special. They decided that what he had was not worthy of them or that he was not worthy of them. My goodness. They turned back and no longer walked with him. There's no greater sin than that. It, it would be better if you never heard the truth than to hear it reject it, and walk away from it consciously. And what we see, this is a heartbreaking truth, that there are those who walk with the Lord and then walk away from him. Because they were walking with him, not for the reason that was most beneficial, but they were walking with him for the context of their own perception. Very important. Hmm. So watch this. In this heartbreaking truth, we see how much it breaks the heart of Christ. Here's what happens. He looks at the 12 and says, do you want to go away as well? 
I shared last week that this statement was not just, it was not arrogance. It was not, okay, you want to go to? Go ahead. I don't need you. No, it wasn't that. It was, I don't want you to go. I really, really know you need me, but do you feel this way as well? Do no words almost, except for what he said, basically. That this is a gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching truth, such that it's like, is it such momentum in their rejection that it possibly may have influenced you? But look what happens. Simon Peter answered, I want you to see this. Let's slow it down and make sure that you don't miss this. It says, Simon Peter answered. It didn't say the 12 answered, did it? It didn't say that Simon Peter answered, then John answered, then another. No, no, it says Simon Peter answered. He was the spokesperson for the group. And look at what his words were. He didn't say, Lord, to whom shall I go? He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed what? The words of eternal life. And have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Because of what? the words of eternal life. Now you say, Brother Leo, okay, you, they, they've been watching his miracles. You, you even go back in the sixth, earlier in the sixth chapter where they were on the boat, Jesus comes walking on the water and Peter says, if it be you, Lord, bid me to come. He comes and he takes his eyes off of Jesus and start focusing on everything else. And he starts to see Jesus gets him up, ask him why he doubts and they go back to the boat together. And when he gets back in the boat, when they get back in the boat, they worship him and they worship him for being the Holy One, the Son of God, the Christ. They worship him for that. And, and the miracle, listen to me carefully, the miracle is what they witnessed. But right here, Peter is not saying that it's because of the miracles. Okay. Jesus goes on. We're going to come back to, the, to this. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. Now watch this. I didn't see this before. He turns to the 12 and says, do you want to go away as well? Peter speaks up before anybody else can. And literally kind of stops it from anybody saying they want to go. Because it's possible <laughs> that Judas would have said, man, I don't know about this. <laughs> and if the if the, the other 11 would have said, let's roll out, he, was, he, he wasn't going to just go by himself. Not in that situation, right? There was no incentive for it to. And we see that later on with Judas, that what he did in betraying Jesus, what he did in walking away from Jesus, he did because of something he would gain. Let, let me share this with you real quick. Don't be deceived to think that betrayal, see, this betrayal was different than just simply rejecting him and walking away. Betrayal is literally that you deceived everyone around you, even yourself, to act like that you were on board with them and you were not. This was a true, true picture of a hypocrite. In other words, Judas, I'm just wanting y'all to hear this, and we're going to come back to Judas later when we get to him. Judas was the picture of hypocrisy in the church among Christ. 
See, the Jews were the picture of hypocrisy from the Old Testament, from the, the Hebrew origin, the, the old covenant and system of governance that came out of Moses. They were the picture of hypocrisy there. But Judas is the example of hypocrisy that we are to take note of. Remember, Judas was one of the ones, and we're going to see this later as well, one of the ones that Jesus sent out to perform miracles. Huh? But Peter says something. Peter says something. While it's a heartbreaking truth, what makes it such a heartbreaking truth that these people walked away from him, that the people did not believe, and Jesus knew that there were some who didn't believe? What even makes it a heartbreaking truth that Judas, chosen by Jesus, was a devil? In other words, that he was of the devil, that he was a follower of the adversary while trying to follow Jesus. What's the difference? They rejected the words of eternal life. I just, I have to say this for us tonight. There's only one way we will remain faithful to God through Christ by the Holy Spirit. That is, and we talked about this recently, is by his word. I was talking with a, um, uh, a guy today, and as we were chatting, he was talking about how the body is like a computer, the body, like a computer. And it's like a computer in this, that it functions on the basis of the programming that it has. So, so watch this. If you have programming that's literally willy-nilly, anything goes, guess what you're going to do with your body? You're going to be willy-nilly with it and anything's going to go and you can find yourself in just a number of situations. Well, I said to him, I said, you know, you make an interesting point. I said, this is the issue that people don't understand they have with regard to their understanding of Christ. Christ gives us the chief programming, the, the only true programming that is designed to guide us in the right manner. And if we don't go and allow that programming to impose upon our mind, then it has no ability to then work its way from our mind to our will to our emotions that it might find its way coming out in our body, in our flesh. It, it doesn't have the ability to do that. The writer in the Psalm says, the word have I stored in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's only one place we sin. Romans seven tells us it's in the flesh. He said, with the mind, we serve the law of God, but with the flesh, we serve the law of sin and death, the flesh. So sin only has the ability to have and gain a foothold and have operation and functionality in this body. But if, but if, if the truth is our companion, if the truth is our stronghold, if it is our protection, our refuge, our trust, then he will keep us. He will stop. Look at, look at what Psalm 91 says. I want to read it real quick. It's, it's in me and it's coming out. So I might as well just read it to you. The first part. He says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Why? For he 
will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. And it goes on. And jump over to nine, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high, who is my refuge? No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. Hmm. Then he says he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder and the young lion, the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Why? The, the, it says the, that because he, this is God speaking, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You don't get that if you don't believe. Not only you don't believe, you don't get that if you don't take in his programming. Receive his word. Listen to me. If you deposit more into your bank account than you take out of it, you can go back to your bank account and you can see that you have more in it and plenty in it, even if you're taking, taking out of it because you're putting in more than you're taking out, okay? We've got to have that same concept with regard to God's word. We got to put God's word. You know, it talks about consider the animal sluggard. And, and that's a great principle with regard to us making sure that we deal with our everyday life in great stewardship and wisdom and perspective and how we deal with our means and our substances and our opportunities. Yes, it's deeper than that. Consider the ant sluggard with regard to your righteousness. Because if you're not careful, you can be walking with Jesus and betray him. You can be walking with Jesus and then walk away from him. Think that what he says is a hard saying and it's offensive to you. And I can be in the same boat. And I can believe that it's offensive to me to hear the truth, to be held accountable, to be told that this is not right. This is right. And here's the thing. I need us to understand this. When we hear the truth, it's not just that we get upset with it. It's if we get upset with it and we stay upset with it, that's a problem. Because it's very likely, because of being in the flesh, we might have an initial response to where we're not too happy about what we hear. But I, I like to use this term to go from frustration to focus as quickly as possible. If we can move from that initial frustration quickly then it speaks to the fact that we have stored in us truth that allows us to transition from that frustration to focus. Let me tell you, I, I'm, I'm not exempt. I'm with you in hard times. Just recently had a situation uh, that really changed the dynamics of what, you know, my, my, my uh, work looked like and a lot of different things. And, uh, it was such that it was kind of expected, but not expected. And, and it's a number of different things. I, I'm not getting into the details of it because it's really not important. My point is how I felt about it initially was uncomfortable. How I felt about it was very, You know how it is. <laughs> we, we don't know how to necessarily put into words. And what I did was, in the past, when I had any type of situation that really shook me good, whether it's professionally, personally, relationally, whatever, like, I, I would just start talking. I mean, saying what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, believing, all of that. I could start calling people, talking to them about it, asking their perspective, what they think. And really, I'm just trying to justify it, one, trying to justify how I feel, and then try to get some people on my side and really create some negativity, subconsciously, by the way. 
didn't know I was doing this. He has the power of the flesh. Anyway, what ended up happening was I said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk to anybody about this right now. I'm, I'm just going to be prayerful about it. I'm going to, you know, take some time to really uh, meditate on the word, seek the word about this. And I kid you not, it was maybe about four days later, the dust kind of settled. And I started thinking a little more sober. I started seeing different things. I started seeing, you know, what the benefit of this situation was. I started seeing what I could do and how I could be able to, you know, take this and put it over here and to, you know, use this for this. I mean, just a lot. It's, you, you start seeing the picture clearly. Why? Because you let the truth, you let the truth be your guide. You let the truth be your refuge. You let the truth be your focus and your trust and not anything else. Not how you felt, not what you thought, what could have been, what should have been, or any of that. To whom shall we go, he says. For you have the words of eternal life. And we have believed on those words and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, let's, let's take our journey into Peter's letters, 2 Peter, the first chapter. Peter says something to us that gives us some very strong perspective. Uh, and when you get a chance, and, and I'll probably link this in the description of the posting of the, the word study. Uh, when you get a chance, check out a message entitled, Why I Choose to Believe the Bible. And it's uh, by a preacher uh, named uh, Dr. Vody Bauckham. Wonderful, wonderful perspective. And like I said, I'll link that down. Uh, once we uh, get that uploaded for you. And he talks about why the Bible is to be, be believed, and he gets into it, it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by uh, people in the lifetime of other people, and it gets into uh, eyewitnesses, the lifetime of eyewitnesses. And uh, he, and, and I know what this is, I, I've, I knew it by heart, but I hadn't rehearse it so um can't remember exactly what it is but he gives us to know in this that what's most important is not what is seen or observed in regards to the miracles of Christ and he gets it from Peter's letter right here in the first chapter where we're going to go so we're going to go to uh, first, I'm sorry, Second Peter. Uh, where is it? I'll start at 12 and we'll read down. That way you can get a, a little bit of context. It says, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Listen carefully. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay, let's take a pause. When he says we were, they were eyewitnesses of his majesty, he's going to tell us what he, he means, but in its context, in the fullness, they saw his majesty displayed in all the miracles, signs, and wonders that he did. But he's going to give us some perspective of what those miracle signs, and wonders did as it pertains to what they came to believe. Let's read. He says, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, 
and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain. Okay, so he wasn't talking about all the miracle signs and wonders, even though those were things that showed forth the majesty and power of Christ Jesus. He was saying that greater than all those things he saw and anything that you might have witnessed as a miracle sign and wonder. He was on the mountain when Jesus became a glorious figure, talked with Elijah and Moses, and even heard the voice of God from heaven. And I think it even said thunder in some, some versions. From heaven, heard the voice of God. That this is his beloved son and who's well pleased to hear him, all right? Listen carefully. I want to give a little caveat of a note here. This right here is something, and, and Pastor Vody talks about this in this message, where we should be very careful when we say, the Lord told me, the Lord said, the Lord spoke to me, <laughs> God spoke to me, because P Peter can say God spoke to him. <laughs> if you go back to, to, to Matthew where that took place, that was pretty powerful, okay? So he goes on and says, we ourselves heard this voice born from heaven from we were with him on the holy mountain now listen carefully and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed in other words we have more fully confirmed we have the more con fully confirmed prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things it's important for us to understand when we look at this piece of the prophetic word this goes back and ties into what Peter said about to whom shall we go for you have the words of for you have the words of eternal life. In other words, it's not just you have the words of eternal life. It goes back to what John said, you are the word. You are the word of eternal life. You are the fully confirmed prophetic word. You are the essence of it. And this prophetic word was not just speaking to the the prophet like the, the, the scriptures that were written by prophets, all of the Old Testament is what's being spoken of here. All of the writings of those of the Old Testament, even now the new. What is it that we should give our attention to? Are we to give our attention to the fish and the loaves? The blinded eyes being opened? Are we eating the flesh and drinking the blood? Are our spiritual eyes being opened? Are we seeing the truth? Are we, as Job says, he, he said, at first I had heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. Now, I, his, he didn't have scales on his eyes or anything. What, what he was saying was he had not, he had been blinded to the truth and who God truly was. You see? The word, the words of eternal life. Peter is trying to say, now this is years after this moment where Jesus said to them, will you also go? Do you want to also go away? Do, do you believe? Is Jesus basically saying, do you believe or do you not believe? It is the word that matter in the context of the heartbreaking truth. It is not that people leave God. It's not that people walk away from God. It is that people misunderstand that what God is most concerned about is what we believe and who we believe. It's not 
that we are on board, that we are a part of the efforts, the, the works that we attend, the services and all of that, those things are good. Those practices help to create habits and certain levels of consistency that enable us to focus on what it is that needs to be focused on. But ultimately, our greatest issue is not necessarily what we do. It's not even only why we do it. It's the power that's behind it. Let's go over to Romans real briefly. I actually been talking about this on Sundays and the messages that I've been sharing. Paul in the seventh chapter, he says something very important. I'm gonna start at seven and 14 and read down a little bit. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. I want you to notice something real quick. The Apostle Paul does not say, I did not understand my own actions. He was an apostle at the time. And he says, I do not, meaning present tense. I do not, right now, I don't understand my own actions. Okay, so let me just help you and encourage you. If sometimes you wonder why you're doing what you're doing and you don't have a clue, you don't understand you in good company. <laughs> Ain't that wrong with you? <laughs> you all right. You just can't stay there. Let's walk through that. He says, for I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but what? Sin that dwells in me. Woo. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I want is what I keep, I'm sorry, the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Hmm. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And then he says, wretched man that I am who would deliver me from this body of death, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now, here's the, here's the thing you got to understand. I want y'all to see this picture. The people who walked away from Jesus and even Judas who betrayed him, all of them focused on their own pleasures. They focused on what they saw, what they felt, what they could sense, basically. It was in the context of their, of their flesh because our senses are in our body. Our senses are not in our spirit, they're in our body, okay? And Paul says here, there's a way that you delight in the law of God. Where do you delight in? In the inner being, okay, that's the soul. The soul of the man is the inner being and then the flesh. Now watch this, y'all might say, okay, how does this make sense? Get somebody in your mind who has passed that you love, somebody recently or in the past, they passed away. When you looked at them in the box that they were laying in, did they talk to you? Did they say something to you? Did they look at you? Did they reach up and hug you? Did they give you some type of indication that they was gonna miss you? No, that's the flesh. What was gone was two things. The Ecclesiastes writer says that the spirit goes back to God who gave it. But also remember, God says that the soul is in the blood. So the oxygen in the blood that gives life to the body 
and allows there to be blood flow so that the brain can function, the nerves can function, the senses can function, which the nerves and all those different things are influenced by the subconscious, which more is the heart and the depth of an individual, which gets to the context of our soul. And our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And you notice he said before this, he says that it was taken captive of his mind. He says, but I see my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive. So it's putting a restriction and a block over the mind. It's putting a restriction and block over the perspective and truth that influences the mind. In other words, the only way, listen to me carefully, the only way the law of sin and death, the only way Satan and, and lies and, and, and unrighteousness can have control over us is that we don't have stored up the truth and that we don't take refuge in it, meaning that we walk in it, we give commitment to it, we give trust to it. And here's what we got to see. The disciples, all of the disciples that were there in this moment heard the same thing that Jesus said. But there were some who processed it based on what they wanted, based on how they saw it, based on how they heard it, based on how they felt it. Mm -hmm. And then there was another group who suppressed what they saw, what they felt, what they heard, and had to rest on what does the truth say what does the word say and we saw from the from the beginning of seeing these disciples uh, engage with Jesus from the time that Nathaniel and Philip began to walk with Jesus how they continued the scripture would tell us how the the disciples continued to to think on what the scripture said about what Jesus was doing think on what the scripture was saying about Jesus doing so much and so when Peter says that you are the Holy One of God, he's not just making that up. That's a reference from the Old Testament. That's a reference from the writings. That's a reference from the scripture. So they were scripture minded. They had the word stored up in their heart. And so as Jesus continued to give them the words of eternal life, it continued to be calcified the more. Problem though, Judas was with them. What does that mean? Judas didn't have the word stored in his heart. And Judas suppressed the truth in his unrighteousness. We read later on and come up very soon, <laughs> probably in about two chapters, where Judas actually says about the woman that anoints Jesus' feet, says, why didn't she uh, sell this for a certain amount of money and give to the poor? And John says, he didn't say that because he cared about the poor. He said that because he was a thief and he would always help himself to the money bag as the treasurer. <laughs> All right, let me get off my soapbox. Heartbreaking truth. Closing this down. What is the heartbreaking truth? The heartbreaking truth is, one, that you can walk with Jesus and turn away from him. But even more so, the only way you can turn away from them is if you don't value what's most important, which is the word. Appreciate the, the miracles and marvelous things that God does for you in your life. If you pray, I, I, I'm going to just encourage you. If you're praying for God to do something in your life in regard to you need a change and things are tough and, you know, it's like it's bad and it's like, I really just need a miracle. Don't stop praying for that, but also don't stop doing what the words say and being a good steward. <laughs> don't stop making a difference and trying to do what's going to be a reflection of what is right. Keep praying for what you believe, because if you doubt, then you should not receive anything from them. But more, more than anything, become more enriched and entrenched in his word. All right, let me get off my soapbox. I want to hear if anybody got any Thing that they want to share tonight to encourage us for what we heard anything that um, was said that really touched you 
Will it position you to continue? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Looks like they're quiet again tonight. Let me just let me just speak and, and say this. Uh, this is what I find, and it may not so much be within the word of what was spoken tonight for everybody, but I can tell you this. If you are a believer and you start seeking Christ and you 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 you'll run into people or things will be presented to you. Um that, that come from a spiritual realm or have a godly aspect. And then you'll see it be more apparent uh, in your following days. So what I mean by this is, take yesterday, for example, I run into this guy named Chris Ford. I run into Chris Ford at the car wash. He tells me basically um, about the sermon in which you just spoke on, this, this study. And what I'm saying is, you see the repetition on whatever um, is, is, is talked about, whatever you're thinking about, it's gonna reappear and it's gonna be sooner than later. As long as you stay true and you seek out his word, God will continue to show you himself so that that, that, that confirmation will consistently be there. As long as you're for real about seeking him out, he's gonna to continue to show you. That's all I want to share with the group. God bless. God bless. Yes. He is faithful to do that. Uh, he, he says that his word will not go out and return void. It will accomplish what he therefore set for it to accomplish. And, you know, I'll say this too in conjunction with what you said, Brandon. If in the law of Moses specifically, and it's kind of changed in our legal system, but it's a, it's not uh, so different when you understand the constructs of the law that on the basis of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Meaning nobody should be killed and this is in the Old Testament. Nobody should be killed except for there are three corroborated witnesses. Like they didn't talk to each other, but they their witness matched. And that's the same thing when it comes to God's word. God is absolutely certain about ensuring that his word is witnessed. I mean, he, he's not going to have, you know, us, you know, out here getting two or three witnesses and he, he has uh, zero or one. <laughs> No, he's got plenty of witnesses. That that's absolutely valuable there, Brandon. Appreciate you for sharing that. Anybody else before we close tonight? All right. You know, closing this this segment out seemed uh Kind of sad, if you will, because I mean we've been we've been in the the chapter of John for a good while, and even this portion, because it seems like there's so much more that could be said, and I'm sure there is. I'm just prayerful and hopeful that what you all walk away from or walk walk away with is to one not be on the side of the heartbreak and not be a cause of the heartbreak. And I, I even say this, don't get me wrong. I truly believe that God really doesn't need us. Uh, if, if, he, if he wanted to, he could just say, you know, I can use somebody else to do what I need to do. But he has shown us that he loves us because as the writer says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us <laughs> and he didn't die for us because of us. It was because of God for God so loved the world. I mean, we've been studying this. That was John three. Why did he do this? Because God so loved the world and, and Nicodemus and the rest of the Jews were not too happy about that. Why? Because it's like, we're your people. 
It's like, no, y'all are my people, but I chose y'all for a purpose. I chose you to be a demonstration. And that's the same concept that we should have. We have been chosen. Even Peter says it in his first letter. He said, um, we have been called out of darkness and to his marvelous light. And we should show forth the praises of him who has done that. Or in some translations, the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So let us do that. Let us not walk away from Christ. Let us not walk away from the truth and create a heartbreaking reality, but let us continue in the truth and find ourselves showing forth the praises and the excellencies of the truth because that brings us continuously into the light. Let us pray tonight. Our Father, we thank you. Thank you that you confirm your word. Thank you that you give us to know what it is that is good, what is beautiful, and what is true. Thank you that you want us to do what is good. Thank you that you intend for us to be good and that it would be impossible without you. Thank you that you even considered us who really can do nothing for you. You considered us valuable to you that we might be able to be instruments of your glory and your majesty. Help us to stand firm. Help us to hear your truth. And regardless of how hard it is, say as Peter said, this might be tough. It might be hard. <laughs> but to whom shall we go? For no one else has the words of eternal life. God, as we continue to go into this study, reveal to us, show us the more and more the power of the truth, not just in being content and information and perspective and wisdom, but in the nature and the identity of Christ. And the reality that we may have that nature and identity and may be completely and continuously conformed to it. Now, as we go, our Father, do as we have always asked you to do. Bless us. Please, Lord, bless us. But not just that we might be blessed. Bless us to be a blessing. In the glorious name of Christ Jesus, by the spirit of truth, we pray. Amen. God bless y'all tonight. Again, y'all be blessed Give to be a blessing. blessing. Yeah.